So uh, you can see some information about me and uh, I'll be entertaining you for the next one hour. Um, so uh, you can see that I was engaged for more than 20 plus years uh, in uh, many different activities in uh, protector relay conferences in, in the development of PNC standards in North America. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, you can see our today's agenda. So we'll be talking about uh, why uh, line differential, why uh, we are using line differential. We'll uh, become familiar with 87 0 principles. Uh, we'll be talking about communications used for this uh, relay. Uh, we'll give some application considerations and we'll take some takeaways and Q&As at the end. Why line differential? I want to start a little bit from the history. I want to remind you that first line uh, current differential protection was uh, patented in 1904 by British engineers Merton Price. And this was uh, pilot wire protection, which is essentially uh, line current differential. And in 1906, 1907 approximately, first line current differential really was in service already. Uh, to compare with the distance, uh, distance principle was patented in 1904 and first distance really was in 1923 approximately. Later on, approximately in the 60s, uh, the phase comparison came into picture uh, when we had a power line carrier, PLC. And somewhere in early 90s, late 80s maybe, the first line current, digital line current differential uh, came to the market. And uh, for the last 30 years, we are developing this really because uh, this principle is becoming is more and more uh, popular and, and used more and more. Uh, many people um, ask some questions, you know, uh, why we are com why we are line differential, not distance. And on, the, on this slide, uh, first of all, uh, you'll have a look at uh, requirements for the line protection. First of all, protection has to be reliable. It has to be dependable and secure. Secondly, uh, we want protection to be fast. We want to clear fault, uh, fault as fast as we can. And also, we, we, we are looking for sensitivity. Sensitivity is the uh, minimum operating want, the minimum fault current uh, really can detect the fault, uh, which is especially important for high resistive faults. Uh, we are also looking for selectivity. We want to operate only within protection zone. <coughs> Excuse me. And we don't want to operate uh, for out of zone <coughs> fault. Excuse me. And lately, uh, we are looking for simplicity. We want it really to be as simple as possible, and we want to get maximum functionality for the minimum cost. So uh, on the left side, you will see advantages of line differential, really. And all of them are actually disadvantages of distance, really. So number one is current only principle. We don't need voltage. So uh, reducing, um, uh, you know, one component of the system, such as such as voltage transformer, increasing reliability of the system. Secondly, it's unit protection. By definition, it operates only for faults within the zone, uh, not like distance again uh, in, in the current. Uh, it's very simple to apply. We are dealing with a few settings. It's very sensitive. It's much more sensitive compared with the other protections because differential principle allows low pickup. It's also fast. Speed is uncompromised. And it's very important, it's immune to power swings, source impeder ratio, mutual coupling, uh, system configurations, and so on. However, uh, there are some disadvantages. We need a channel, and it means we need um, uh, it's an additional cost. We need two or more relays, it's a system, so it cannot work on its own, not like distance over current. We need channel monitoring, because channel impairments will affect 87L. We need backup protection. Uh, when channel fails, uh, we still need to protect the line. We need some strategy for this. And there are some very unique challenges uh, which only uh, exist for 87L. It's a channel symmetry and charging current. So uh, this is what it looks like, and everybody I'm sure knows this. So we have two relays connected with a communication link, and we have uh, current uh, CTs at both ends of the line, and this is making our zone of the H7L protection. 
so we need two relays in, the, in case of two terminal line or three relays. If it's a three terminal line, and they have to be same vintage and same software. You cannot have one relay from one vendor, another relay from another vendor, or one really older generation, another really newer generation. You cannot have this. Uh, and also we need a digital communication channel, which we call N times 64 kilobit per second. And we need to align phasers, and this is the most difficult part of the differential. I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, under the hood, but it is difficult uh, from the technical point of view. So if you look at the traditional percent differential characteristic, you would see that, you know, there is a, a minimum pickup zone, uh, slope one and slope two zones, and it's a traditional operate and restrained uh, differential characteristic. And uh, differential is, uh, is the sum of all um, zone input currents. And restraint here, we have uh, two approaches. One is uh, to use a sum of absolute values of all input uh, zone input currents, or we can have restraint as a maximum of uh, zone input currents. And uh, traditionally, like uh, in electromechanical or static relays, the percent differential was static. Because so this is what it is. We measure current, we do differential, comparing operate, restraint, and they make a decision. So it's a compromise between sensitivity and security. I have this slide uh, for two purposes. Uh, purpose number one is uh, to show you that um, any percent differential uh, relay characteristic can be shown either in differential plane, uh, differential to restrain current, or in the complex plane, which is also called alpha plane. Uh, and this is the ratio of the local to remote currents uh, in major and unreal. And uh, we can see that uh, this, is a, this slide is showing the restraint characteristic for percent differential really what I showed in the previous slide. And we can see that uh, this is the restraint part. So if uh, the, the ratio of this uh, complex ratio of uh, local to remote current falls somewhere outside, it indicates that there is a fault and we would treat. But we can see also that um, a restraint can be bigger or smaller. And this depends on the, first of all, estimation of, um, of factor of uh, um, errors in the estimation of the phaser of CT saturation, harmonics, and so on. Uh, and also, uh, we can have um, some uh, human factor. We can say, you know, that uh, if it's external fault, uh, we probably want uh, to increase our restraint, and this is what we uh, sometimes call transient bias. So this would help us to uh, deal better with the external faults. So for 87L, there are some uh, major three challenges, and this is what is making 87L different from all other differentials, like bus differential, transformer differential, and so on. First of all, the data from opposite line terminals has to be precisely aligned. Uh, they don't have this problem in transformer bus differential because all data is local. But here, we have some data local and some remote, which will come uh, with a delay. Now we have communication channel, digital communication channel. So we are sending ones and zeros. And uh, you know, we can have many channel impairments, and we'll talk about them later, which can jeopardize security of H7L, and we have to deal with this. And the third unique problem is line charging current. We'll talk about this later as well. So this section, we'll be talking about communications. Traditionally, and this is how uh, the digital line current differential started, uh, we had a direct fiber uh, channel. And uh, this was uh, very good, convenient. However, it was not economical because running direct fiber from substation to another substation <laughs> Uh, you know, only for this 64 kilobit per second channel uh, uh, meant that, you know, we are not utilizing fiber optic properly. And later on, uh, you know, the uh, multiplex uh, communications came into picture. And uh, to um, interface the multiplexer, uh, we could use uh, G703, RS422, X.21 um interfaces electrical interfaces and uh, later on somewhere probably in 2005 uh, around this uh, the ltpc 3784 
protocol came in the picture, um, which is um, connection of the relay to the multiplexer uh, via fiber optic cable. And today, these days, um, we were using Sonnet system and we were using uh, time division multiplex, uh, time division uh, multiplexing uh, for the for the channel. But today, more and more, we are we are, we are hearing about MPLS. And uh, this is where our industry is going. So, what is MPLS? The best thing to uh, the, the best way to think about um, MPLS is a collection of virtual switches and routers presented on a real layer three architecture. So, it's much more efficient uh, protocol, Ethernet protocol uh, for communications. And um, uh, you can think about uh, your plugging in the network port. Ethernet port uh, relay on one at one substation, and you are plugging other relay at another substation, and it's like just both relays are also on the same network, so it's it's very easy to apply. So uh, in our industry, MPLS, we are using uh, um, a special uh, flavor of MPLS, which is called MPLS TP. So MPLS TP, uh, which is which stands for transfer profile. Uh, it's um, combining the traffic efficiency of the uh, internet MPLS protocol and Sonnet SDH uh, system. So uh, more and more today utilities are moving into this technology and, um, and really uh, can be connected to MPLS either directly uh, via Ethernet port or uh, they can interface this MPLS multiplexer via C3794 protocol. So this slide is to give you an idea of uh, uh, how far we can go with direct fiber. So depending on the type of the fiber we have, if it's multi-mode or single mode, and depending on the line driver, if it's LED or LED or laser, we can go from somewhat five kilometers to 125 kilometers. This is direct fiber. And I can tell you that direct fiber is still most preferred channel because it's uh, it's most secure and it doesn't have um, uh, you know problems what we may expect uh, with the multiplex channel. But unfortunately, uh, direct fiber uh, is costly. So this slide uh, shows you uh, what is a um, two terminal uh, application to terminal line. Uh, to, to terminal line, they have uh, channel one, which is uh, transmit of one, uh, really uh, connect to receive of another, and vice versa. But having just one channel uh, means that you know if channel uh, this channel um, fails, you know uh, we are losing uh, protection. So this is why we are providing uh, an option to have a redundant channel, and it's a good idea to have a redundant channel over different media. For example, one will be direct fiber. Another will be a multiplex channel. In the three thermal uh, configuration, you can see that uh, our um, uh, communication channels are connected in the triangle fashion. So this real number one connects to two, two to three, and three to back to one. And we can think that uh, here we don't have redundancy, but this is not the case. And next slide uh, will explain you why. So, for example, we have. Um, Three terminal application. We can see that uh, you know on the primary side we have a tap from the from the line, and uh, when all channels are uh, alive, are running, um, all relays are communicated to each other, and all relays are making independent decisions. So if fault occurs on the line, we would ship the line. Each relay will ship individually. This is actually a big benefit of line differential that we ship all breakers on the line. Uh, simultaneously, and we are um, uh, reducing or eliminating uh, any transient, which can happen when we, when we trip sequentially. For example, distance, you know, we can have one of the line tripping on one, other end of the line will trip uh, via pilot scheme, say 20 milliseconds later or even later. So we'll have some current reversal, transients, and so on. So we are stressing the system less with the current differential because we are tripping simultaneously. Uh, back to um, three terminal configuration. So, uh, if one channel fails, you can see that really three and really two between them really uh, channel fails, and now really uh, two and three, uh, they are not receiving data between them. 
However, they are still able to send data to really one. So we can see that uh, real number one now has all uh, information needed to detect the fault. And this is why um, the system now is able to reconfigure to master slave. Uh, so now really one becomes master, making differential decision and sending DTT to all other really, and uh, fault is cleared. So there is a redundancy built in, even in the three terminal configuration. So relays are continuously exchanging data. What are we sending uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the communication package? We are sending, of course, the current phasers, and we are sending other data. What is our data? Other data is direct sense for trip, uh, some control data to let other really know that uh, really is not blocked, that really is not uh, experiencing any, any errors, that uh, everything is running well. We have also direct um, IOs, uh, some eight bits, which, which we uh, transfer between relays for some control purposes. And we have uh, some, uh, some other data as well. And uh, relays are sending uh, and receiving uh, phasers or samples uh, plus other data, uh, you know, uh, continuously. And typically, the exchange between relays is happening two to four times per power cycle. However, data is coming with a channel delay, and data needs some proper alignment. So uh, here we can see that uh, relay A, say in at time T, uh, relay A is uh, receiving a sample. At the same time T, uh, the relay B is also um, receiving a sample. Now uh, the relay, two relays are sending the sample to each other. However, we can see that um, relay A will receive sample um, from relay B uh, with some delay, which is denoted here uh, with the D letter, means delay. Uh, so what it means that uh, at the moment when it receives data, you know, uh, the, the data which is needed to be aligned to this already uh, has to be uh, saved, stored into the buffer. Um, so uh, <clears throat> uh, to align the data properly, <clears throat> excuse me, To align the data properly, <clears throat> we have uh, two types of synchronization. First is peer-to-peer self-synchronization. And, uh, and here we have two um, different approaches. One is synchronous sampling, meaning that we will synchronize clocks, the sampling clocks of these two relays, that, uh, that really will get the sample at exactly the same time and sample this sample. It will be timestamped. And uh, when when sample arrives to other end, you know we know by timestamp what has to be aligned to what. Another approach is asynchronous sampling, and uh, this approach is uh, you know we can sam we can sample uh, asynch uh, asynchronously, um, and uh, when sample arrives, we need to know the channel delay, we need to uh, know, uh, know channel delay, and we we need to resample possibly. Uh, to get proper alignment. And yet another uh, type of synchronization is external time reference synchronization, which means GPS. So if we are getting um, all timestamps, uh, uh, all, all samples uh, with the timestamps, um, uh, with the GPS timestamps, it means that you know we can align them naturally. Uh, so this is ping pong. So what is ping pong? Ping pong is a um, mechanism uh, to estimate two things, uh, round trip delay and clock offset. And how it's doing, uh, it's, it's done from these four timestamps, T0, T1, T2, and T3. So T0 and T3 are taken from the relay A, and T1 and T2 are taken from the relay B. And when we have a um, set of these four timestamps, we can calculate two Values. One value is round trip delay. Round trip delay is needed for relays which are doing asynchronous sampling, and they need to align phasers by by knowing the round trip delay, and um, uh, and rotating phaser uh, by certain degree to align with the local phaser. And clock offset is needed for relays which are doing synchronized sampling. If you remember, this is uh, category number one uh, in the previous slide. So uh, we need to talk about channel impairments, unfortunately. Um, and here we have we can have noise, and especially this is uh, on the um, 
uh, on the electrical interfaces such as G703 or S422. And uh, due to noise, data can be corrupted, and we need to detect this. So for this purpose, we have um, CRC, Cyclic Redundancy Code, uh, to detect uh, data corruption. We also can experience channel loss and recovery. We need to deal with this properly. Channel jitter, which result in the loss of some data, uh, really also has to tolerate this. Uh, we can have a repeated data over redundant channel, we need to discard uh, the same data, not to use the same data twice. We can have a channel switching. Uh, we can have variable channel delay, and uh, really has to deal with this, has to recognize, uh, to do alignment properly. And this is what making this uh, really very complicated. We also can have a loopback, especially on the least channel when we are going through telco equipment. Uh, the, the normal... Um, uh, you know, way to test the channel is to do a loopback. And uh, um, I, I had at least few cases where, you know, technician in the telco company would do a loopback uh, without knowing that this channel is actually used for current differential and suddenly really would trip uh, because uh, channel addressing was not enabled. Uh, we can have channel asymmetry. We'll talk about this later, and we can have uh, we can have synchronization error. So uh, it may be not exactly precise the timing, and we need to deal with this. And uh, the best way to uh, make our protection secure uh, against these communication impairments is uh, disturbance detector supervision. And this all line differential relays they have this ability uh, to have a supervision, and this is a recommended practice, especially for multiplex channel. Channel asymmetry. What is channel asymmetry? Uh, difference in transmit and receive paths is causing incorrect synchronization between relays uh, because ping pong uh, always assumes that uh, transmit receive delays are equal. If uh, currents and channel asymmetry are high enough, really can be separate. And this how it looks like uh, in the sonnet system. So we, we have a relay A. Uh, connected to the add and drop multiplexer number one, and uh, we have really B connected to add, add and drop multiplexer number four. And they're communicating over a short path between them. However, when a channel, one leg of this uh, channel fails, uh, we can go now through the longer path. And this is what uh, um, introducing a channel asymmetry, and uh, we need to deal with this. Channel asymmetry would uh, manifest itself as an um, angular displacement of the local to remote currents, and as a result, we will see a differential current. So all line differential relays today that have ability to, to measure channel asymmetry and compensate for this using uh, GPS uh, signals. So a uh, few application considerations. Uh, first of all, we can have a situation where uh, substation, uh, one substation and um, uh, other substation on, on the other end of the line have a different city ratio. And this can happen when we have uh, different utilities, they're using, uh, they have different standards, different practice, and uh, we need to deal with this. Uh, so we cannot uh, request that all city are the same. So today, um, the line current differential relays, they can tolerate up to 10 times, depending on the relay, of course, uh, CT ratio. Uh, and, and we can have uh, either primary different or secondary different, it doesn't matter, uh, we can deal with this. However, uh, when you have very uh, big difference in CT ratio, uh, we can have some issue uh, during external fault, because uh, CT characteristics are different, and uh, one CT can saturate more than another, or we can have um, uh, one CT does not saturate and other CT uh, will saturate. Another important practice is dual breaker application. So uh, traditionally, what we had, we were summing up uh, CTs, and this is what is shown here. On the left side, you can see um, a terminal where we have two breakers, and you can see uh, that um, uh, if all happens, uh, you know, upstream, uh, what is shown here. So we can see that um, upper CT on the left side uh, will take 
currents from uh, both um, uh, uh, um, bottom city uh, of the same line terminal and also from the remote terminal. Uh, so what's happening now uh, that you know this city, um, upper city on the on the left side, uh, will 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 experience the highest current, and uh, this highest current uh, because of highest current, this city can saturate and we can have some differential, which is denoted here as this green uh, dashed line uh, error. Um, so what what can happen that you know? Uh, this uh, will cause some CT saturation, and uh, this current will appear uh, as 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 during as for during the internal fault and real time to separate. Just to give you an idea, for example, if we have um, the current top left current carrying 12 uh, per unit current, and the bottom left uh, carrying 10 PU current, and on the right uh, it's a 2 PU current. So uh, if we sum up these two, uh, we would we would have a two PU on the left side, but due to saturation, it can be uh, not not two; it can be 2.5 PU, for example. So we will have like 0.5 PU of differential current. But most important is that um, you know we will have restraint equal to two PU only, because here we summed up these two currents and uh, on the left side, and uh, they would give us uh, two PU current. If we measure current individually, so we would measure 12 PU for the top city and 10 PU for the bottom city, and the restraint for for all um, for for both terminals would be equal to 12 PU opposed to 2 PU. So we can see that restraint from some current is much lower. And in my practice, I had uh, many misoperations during this summation. So uh, this is uh, how it's looking in the modern uh, digital line differential relay. Uh, we have uh, two breakers on the left side, and we have CT1 and CT2, uh, which are uh, connected to the terminals of the relay. And we can see that uh, breaker failure, we can do a per breaker now, and uh, the line, dif line current differential 87L function will also have uh, per breaker current, which will uh, allow to uh, develop a proper restraint. Uh, and also, but but for distance, for example, we can uh, sum up these uh, CTs, and uh, we can provide the source for distance and um, and current protection. This is what available today in release, and um, we'll do synchro check and we do reclosure per breaker. Uh, this is what is recommended for the um, dual breaker applications. Uh, charging current. Charging current caused by uh, line capacitor reactance, which is showing in the middle of the picture, uh, and it, uh, it has coupling between phases and also coupling phases to the ground. And uh, charging current will appear uh, as a pure differential current, but also we have on the line, we have a reactor. So uh, we can see that uh, reactor uh, current um, uh, will compensate some charging current. Um, uh, but uh, the problem is that reactor can be switched on or off, and it means that the uh, charging current to the relay may be variable. Uh, charging current can be significant. Uh, on the 230 kV line uh, here in example, charging current can be 0.73 amps per mile, but if you have an underground cable, it will be approximately 20 times higher, so it can be as high as 18.6 amps, and uh, if you have, say, 20 kilometers, uh, sorry, 20 miles of the underground cable, so we are getting approximately uh, 400 um, amps of the differential current, of the charging current, uh, differential current. Uh, this, will, um, uh, this will force us to increase uh, pickup setting and distance type protection if we don't compensate for the charging current. And we don't want to sacrifice uh, sensitivity of the protection. So uh, to um, to compensate for charging current, uh, relays are providing settings, enable or disabling uh, charging current, and we need to enter a proper value for the uh, for the positive sequence capacity reactance of the line, and zero sequence capacity reactance of, of the line. And really, from the measured voltage and uh, values of these reactances, we'll calculate 
and we'll subtract this and we'll reduce uh, the differential current uh, approximately eight to 10 times. Uh, but there is another um, complication here. So um, on the right side uh, of the picture um, of the slide, you can see that we have um, a reactor and we have uh, line to pistons. The problem is uh, that uh, reactor can be switched on or off. And uh, uh, when, when the reactor is on, the uh, value of the charging current is reduced, and we need to change the uh, value of the capacitor reactants. But complexity is that we have a reactor on other end of the line as well. So uh, we have now the many combinations of reactor on or off, and we need to deal with the setting. Uh, to avoid this complexity, uh, what is recommended is um, to, uh, to provide um, uh, current uh, from the reactor, uh, third input to the H7L, and we would subtract the um, reactor current. This would uh, make the um, uh, charging current a steady, full value and steady. So we don't need any switching. Uh, we don't need uh, to, to monitor the position of the reactor breaker. Another complication for line current differential is stop bus. So uh, assume we have uh, this um, three-terminal line and, uh, and uh, everything is normal, all breakers are closed, and we have power exchange between all three terminals. However, if um, the line disconnect switch at one substation, which has two breakers here, uh, is open, is opening, so now we have a situation where uh, we have here CTs and we have a, a, a small zone between these two CTs uh, and uh, disconnect switch, uh, which we call stop bus. So we can see that if these uh, CTs are still included in the line uh, uh, differential zone, and if there is any fault in the stop bus, uh, no, we would, uh, we would trip the line, which is not desirable. Uh, now we have two uh, different zones. So now our line now divided by into two different zones. One is line zone where we still have power exchange between line terminal three and line terminal two. And uh, line terminal one uh, became a smaller differential zone just between these two breakers. But we still, have, uh, we still can have a power flow here. And if there is a fault um, in, in the zone, it's stop bus zone. Uh, we need to open breaker one and breaker two. So uh, what, what, why we have this stop bus protection in uh, our line relays is first of all, uh, providing um, uh, a separate protection for this when the line disconnect is open uh, to provide protection for this stop bus zone. And secondly, we need to exclude current from breaker one and breaker two at the bottom. We need to exclude this current from the line protection zone which now is between terminal three and terminal two. And also we need to, to think about our pile protection for tripping and blocking schemes applied. Uh, we need to deal with this appropriately. CT saturation. So uh, many papers, uh, many reports on this, uh, and we have standards. So we have uh, IEEE standard C37110, uh, guide for application of current transformers used for protective purposes, and we have IEC 61869-2, instrument transformers, uh, additional requirements for current transformers, defining CD saturation, avoidance and estimation. So uh, it is desirable to avoid saturation. However, um, it's, it's not always possible. It re it's requiring uh, applying more and more expensive and bigger CTs, which is not practical. So uh, when we have internal fault, CT saturation um, is not causing any, any problem to us. But when we have external fault and we have asymmetrical CT saturation, uh, this may be a problem. Uh, so how it looks like uh, when we have asymmetrical CT saturation is shown here. So if you have really one and really two, uh, really one, which is black, uh, no saturation, this really is not experiencing. You remember uh, we spoke about uh, CT tap before. This is uh, very much possible where, where you have this situation when one CT has lower ratio and another CT has higher ratio. 
So really two red is saturated and quite, quite heavily. So uh, this saturation is causing this differential current, which is shown in green line, this is the raw current. We just sum up these two currents uh, to show uh, raw differential current. And this is the magnitude of the current in blue. And we can see that magnitude is quite significant. So how it's appearing on the phasor diagram. So if you capture phasors and plot the diagram, it will, be, it, it will look like this. So we have primary current from really one black and the primary current from uh, really two perfectly 180 degrees apart and perfectly same uh, value and primary differential current is zero. Uh, secondary, secondary current uh, really are, are one uh, black still uh, correct. So it, it has correct angle and it has correct magnitude because uh, it's reduced by the city ratio. But red are really two current. We can see that magnitude is reduced and we have some angular displacement. This angular displacement of really two is causing differential current uh, showing in blue here and our really is in danger. So uh, there are, um, in every manufacturer is giving in their manuals um, recommendations how to avoid situation. And um, um, and um, uh, and um, uh, sometimes it is not uh, it's not easy even to estimate the impact of the situation of, of on the really even following uh, the recommendation of the manual. The best thing to test is of course uh, to do um, dynamic testing uh, such as RTDS PS card and test certain really uh, with these waveforms and see uh, if really is dealing with saturation properly or not. Uh, today, uh, there are many investments in protective relays uh, to deal with saturation properly, and um, uh, but still uh, we want to be safe. We want to be sure that uh, application is safe. So uh, um, we have on our website. This is what is shown here. Um, the the application you can download, and uh, this uh, will help you to to estimate the complexity of. Um, of uh, estimating saturation from the manuals is you can have uh, two CTs and you can have um, CT, uh, you can have a fault, uh, at the fault level different and CT is different and so on. So we have this application on our website which helps you uh, to model exactly your CT. You need to enter CT characteristic here, enter uh, fault currents and uh, it will give you a response of the really it will help you to estimate uh, the response to this um, So I will briefly talk about settings um, this is the Settings of the traditional percent differential really and we can have um, a source you remember we can have up to three sources I was showing in the previous slide uh, we can have pickup. Uh, pickup uh, has to be chosen uh, based on the application, based on the charging current uh, um, and other factors, uh, CTs uh, and so on. Uh, we have CT tab to compensate for the ratio as we spoke before. Uh, we have uh, slopes, slope one, slope two, um, to adjust our characteristic uh, to make it safer. And this will maybe based on our estimation of the situation, uh, what we, show, we have shown before. Uh, we have a breakpoint break uh, between uh, slope one and slope two. Uh, if we have in zone transformer, today really is our allowing to have a transformer um, between uh, line terminals and uh, you can enable um, in Russian Hibit uh, if you have this. Uh, we have also ground differential. Ground differential is to deal with the uh, high resistive faults. Uh, so it allows us to set a phase differential slightly uh, higher. Uh, and uh, uh, for the high resistive faults, we'll have the sensitive protection, which will detect the fault and will trip the line. And we have, of course, uh, DDT and key DDT functionality. So, uh, what are takeaways uh, from our presentation? 87L is simple, secure, fast, and dependable unit protection for transmission and distribution line. And I, I, I should say that more and more uh, we are seeing that uh, this protection is applied transmission, 
sub transmission and even distribution lines. And uh, more and more, I'm seeing, for example, on the um, extra high voltage line, when we have uh, three relays, usually we have, uh, we, we see two line current differential relays and one distance relay. Um, this just to give you an idea that um, uh, this protection is uh, more and more uh, used uh, for transmission line protection. Uh, it is it uh, is dependent heavily on the reliable communication channel for the proper operation. So, and we, you need to have a backup protection during channel impairments. Uh, th this is something uh, important, um, and uh, we have a different um, uh, approaches here. Uh, some are applying um, distance in parallel with line differential. Some want to disable distance and rely on differential and only enable distance when line differential is uh, has a channel failure. And, and this is possible uh, using uh, release today. Um, as every differential protection, it relies uh, on the proper CT performance uh, while it has some built-in securities against CT saturation. Um, and uh, each relay um, is different. Each relay is uh, dealing differently with the CT saturation. So uh, I think uh, we still need to do testing, estimate, and do some evaluation uh, against CT saturation. And uh, some engineering uh, still required, even not as extensive uh, as for other line protection functions, uh, but but still we need to do some engineering. I need to say that we received many questions and uh, possibly will not be able uh, to answer all of them. We'll try to answer as many as we can. Uh, so the first question is details about hybrid scheme differential line protection, conventional uh, and, and digital substation. Um, so it is possible today uh, that uh, on one end of the line you have a conventional protection and other end of the line you have digital substation and you have sample values, merged units, sample values uh, providing to line current differential. So uh, it is uh, possible to protect this line. There are some complications, but um, our realists today are able to deal with this. The complication is about uh, data alignment. So you, you saw in my slide before uh, that um, we need to align data properly. So what's happening on one of the end of the line, you have a merged unit. And um, we need to know the delay from the magic unit to the uh, line current differential relay. We need to estimate this delay and we need to compensate it uh, to align with the other end of the relay with the conventional relay. So, um, uh, but uh, if uh, we provide a GPS clock, a 15 day clock, I should say, uh, to both uh, magic unit and if clocks are accurate, and uh, to line differential really, uh, we are able to measure this delay and, and compensate for risk and align phasers uh, at both ends of the line um, properly. The next question is latest innovations or research proposing improvements related to line differential current limitations. Um, Yes, uh, as I mentioned before, um, the line differential protection is evolving uh, and it's evolving for the last 30 years. So uh, today, uh, major improvements are, um, first of all, uh, multi-thermal protection is, uh, is more in demand than before because we are, we are building uh, some renew renewable generation, some stations, we are tapping them uh, of the transmission line, and we need more terminals. And, um, and relays uh, today, line differential relays, are capable to, uh, to have more than three terminals. And we have in our portfolio, we have a relay P54 capable uh, to protect six, up to six terminals uh, of the line. So uh, this is a trend uh, we need to... Uh, need to follow. 
Another development, as I mentioned, MPLS. Uh, I think today we are seeing that more and more utilities are moving uh, into this technology, MPLS, and uh, relays have to deal with this. Uh, relays have to interface uh, to um, MPLS multiplex multiplexer directly. Um, another thing uh, from our um, uh, validation and testing, we, we, all, we, we need to mention that MPLS is giving better performance uh, for line differential purposes compared with the TDM uh, technology. So uh, we observe that, um, for example, uh, the, the channel is faster uh, and also asymmetry is less uh, compared with the TDM technology. Uh, another development in line current differential is uh, trailing wave protection. Uh, we don't have such really in our portfolio at the moment, uh, but um, uh, this uh, trailing wave uh, line differential requires a direct fiber uh, because uh, it needs a very high bandwidth. Um, and also it's not 100% uh, dependable because the, um, uh, the traveling wave technology needs uh, some energy of the traveling wave. And f if fault is happening uh, not at the peak, uh, the energy in, of the traveling wave may be not enough uh, for line differential. Uh, next improvement is uh, detection of uh, internal external fault uh, to improve security during this situation. And this is what uh, all realists today are um, are doing uh, have some uh, built-in logic for to detect the external fault and increase um, restraint, and this is the area which is still developing. Um, the the next uh, development, uh, I think, sample va sample values based differential. Uh, this is also uh, possible today, and um, and we are having uh, products which are supporting this. And yet another development is the speed. So we, we are still striving to have a sub-cycle uh, differential relay, and uh, we have developments in the uh, distance relaying and line differential uh, as well. Um, next question. What is the performance comparison of using GPS uh, via a ping pong method for line differential relay communication? Actually, performance of the line differential will be exactly the same. There, will, there won't be any difference. Um, but the only difference, we need to uh, recognize that adding uh, more devices to the system uh, is decreasing uh, the reliability of the system. And what it means is that we are adding another source, which is a clock, which is switch, uh, which is, uh, to, to bring the clock and sample values and so on. So um, what it means that uh, performance uh, is not affected, reliability, it depends on reliability of, uh, of our communication system and, and especially clock. Next question, how to test the characteristic curve of the 87L practical examples? Unfortunately, uh, during this webinar, it is impossible to give a practical examples uh, uh, but um, um, first of all, I want to mention that we have uh, a tool uh, on our website which you can use, and you can um, uh, you can uh, test characteristic curve, and uh, and you can analyze the performance. You can ask this tool to give you a test points. So it will generate test points, and you will test the curve. Also, this tool, uh, what we have on our website, um, will allow you uh, to visualize uh, the characteristic in the differential um, uh, and also in the alpha planes. And, and you, can, uh, you can test in either differential or alpha planes. I think it's good to uh, recognize that um, differential can be uh, in differential and alpha plane as well. Uh, next question, uh, what is the maximum time a differential really could wait to trip right after a fail is detected and channel lately recovered? So this depends uh, on the specific relay. Uh, I, I can talk about, uh, for example, how you are a relay. Really. This relay really can wait uh, four power cycles uh, till the data gets discarded. So what it means that uh, if channel is lost, 
the local relay is continuing storing, uh, continue, continue measuring and storing phasers and waiting the channel recovers. So if channel recovers and, and data start becoming game, and if channel recovers within four power cycles, really would operate right away. But, but again, it depends on the real design. Next question. How to secure real operation against communication related jitter, etc.? So uh, I need to mention that um, you don't have to do anything to secure really. So if really is not secure by design, you cannot do anything. Uh, but uh, manufacturers are are um, designing and testing relays, uh, you know, to take care about uh, all these communication impairments. What I presented uh, in in the in my slide. However, in relays we have um, uh, in, in indication of of impairments. For example, in the relay we can see that uh, uh, the delay is wearing. We can capture. We can uh, alarm for this. Uh, we can see that um, we have a noise uh, which is resulting in uh, in CRC uh, lost packets, um, and uh, we, we can uh, if we have too many lost packets, it means that protection dependability is degraded, and we need to do something. Uh, we also need we, we also can measure asymmetry, and uh, we. Uh, uh, and uh, from asymmetry, we, we, we can say, you know, uh, we, you probably need uh, asymmetry compensation because uh, your application is not secure. Um, uh, unfortunately, testing how really is doing, is, is handling these uh, communication impairments. Testing is not simple. Testing is quite complicated. It requires specialized equipment which is able to inject uh, noise into channel, uh, inject uh, variable delay, and uh, and jitter and so on and asymmetry um, and uh, it requires specialized equipment. Next question: Will 87L via pilot wire be discussed? Uh, you know, line current differential is a big topic, and uh, I didn't talk about many other things uh, which are possible, but. Uh, it is possible to apply digital line current differential really via existing pilot wire, and this technology uh, we have we have applications of this, and this is technology using uh, DSL modem, and we have experience with this. So if you are interested, please please contact our local GE representative, and uh, we'll be happy to to help you. Next question. Uh, what principle G line differential really work, alpha plane or current differential method? Um, actually, I need to know that there were many questions about uh, alpha plane. And uh, let's talk about this a little bit more. Um, I think it's interesting for everybody. Uh, the question, the answer is that uh, GE line differential really work on the true differential principle. And true differential principle is a percent differential uh, where we where we calculate uh, differential current and we calculate restraint current and we compare them and if differential is above restraint uh, we operate. Yeah. So, sorry, some noise. Um, uh, alpha plane uh, is not something uh, new. Uh, I need to know that. Uh, uh, there was a book uh, published by Warrington in 1969, which is called Protective Relay and Practice, uh, which actually introduced alpha and beta plane. So alpha and beta, beta plane is um, a, a tool to visualize a characteristic, to visualize characteristic. So uh, we need to understand that uh, relay is not working in the alpha plane or differential plane. Relay is working uh, by uh, measuring input currents, uh, running equations, mathematical equations, uh, comparators, and deciding if we operate, uh, if, if there is a fault or not. So uh, alpha plane is a way to show characteristic uh, based on the ratio of the local to remote current. And this is what it is. Uh, so you 
you, as you showed before in my presentation, uh, the, the ratio of the local to remote current would uh, present a characteristic. So, uh, unfortunately, um, um, comparing differential, uh, percent differential, and alpha plane, um, I cannot say that alpha plane is better, operates better, or more secure, or more sensitive. I cannot say it. Uh, I think um, I think uh, they're either about the same or a differential is better, percent differential. And why? Because with the percent differential, we have ability to uh, adjust our restraint, and you don't have this ability uh, in uh, uh, alpha plane relays. And if you think about um, uh, about um, restraint current in alpha plane really is something fictitious value because uh, you have only three settings in the alpha plane really, which is the radius and uh, and uh, an angle and the pickup current, three values. You don't have uh, a value to adjust restraint current. You don't have this, not like in percent differential really. And uh, one more thing, uh, if alpha plane is, uh, would give a better performance, uh, why wouldn't it be used for bus or transformer differential protection? So I, I hope uh, I maybe I surprised you by what I said, but uh, I hope uh, I made it uh, more or less clear. Next question, how is tap load accounted for? So the best way to account for the tap lot is actually to have a measurement uh, of, of, uh, on the tap terminal. This is the best way because uh, if you don't have measurement, you're, uh, you're, and you're measuring only on, on the two terminals of the line, uh, you, you, will, you, you have many problems to deal with. Uh, first of all, you have um, tap lot current. Secondly, you have um, uh, fault on the low voltage side of the tap transformer, and uh, you you need to deal with this. Uh, so what we can do, we can use some supervision. For example, distance supervision, which will not uh, um, uh, overreach for the low voltage side uh, on the tap loads. However, uh, the system be is becoming uh, too complex, and system is becoming uh, uh, not very reliable. Uh, next question. <clears throat> Can you compare line differential uh, against distance and pinus protection? What are the merits of each? What uh, are examples uh, where both uh, would be used together? Um, you, you know, uh, it depends on the practice. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, some people are using uh, both uh, together and some, may say some want to, to enable distance when line differential channel fails. Uh, so by principle, line differential is unit protection and, uh, and it's, um, it's superior, superior compared with the distance. Um, however, uh, distance, uh, you know, uh, enabling distance when channel fails, uh, there is some gap uh, between declaring channel failure and uh, and uh, enabling differential. So there is some gap and there is some uh, you know some risk that uh, fault will happen during this time. So, uh, but uh, I think both both are um, uh, important protection. Both can be used. Uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, I think time is coming to the end, and uh, my colleagues and I were very pleased to give this presentation today, and I hope you enjoyed and learned. The line current differential topic is quite big, and we are sure you still may ha have some questions. Please contact us as soon as possible. I would like to thank all of you for attending this webinar, and we are looking forward to continuing discussion on line current differential and, may, and any other topic you may be interested in. Pauline, back to you. Thank you, Ilya, and thank you everyone for attending. As always, stay well and look after yourselves. This concludes today's webinar. Have a wonderful day.